This is a podcast from Duncan Cartledge Online, the online resource for all construction professionals that's available 24-7. Now please don't forget to subscribe at the place you usually get your podcasts so as not to miss a thing in this second series, as well of course as visiting our YouTube channel. Hello again and welcome to another podcast from Duncan Cartledge Online. As usual, Barney, my Red Labrador, is here to offer advice and to keep an eye on proceedings. In this episode, we'll have a look at procurement trends, payment and retention, and whatever happened to soft landings and government soft landings. A lost opportunity? Incidentally, if you feel moved to write a review of this podcast, hopefully a positive one, please do. So let's kick off with a look at trends in procurement. Latest figures appear to show an increase in the popularity of two-stage tendering as well as negotiation. At a time when more Tier 1 contractors are turning away from competitive tendering in favour of negotiation, what are the issues surrounding this approach to procurement? Certainly the traditionalists, who simply, in my opinion, reinforce the them and us culture, have always warned against negotiation except where there's no choice or time is the issue and or the work is highly specialised. Anecdotally, it is said that negotiation results in a price about 10% higher than competition although this doesn't take into account savings in time and other advantages. In my experience, negotiation need not necessarily result in higher cost. However, one thing is certain. In order for negotiation to be successful, there needs to be trust and a common goal between all parties. Something that I've commented previously, we do not have an abundance of in the construction industry. Two principal methods of progressing a negotiation are direct negotiation, where negotiation is between the client and the contractor or subcontractor to arrive at a price, and indirect negotiation, where negotiation is between a third party acting on behalf of the client and the contractor subcontractor. In addition, a variant on the above is competitive negotiation when a client asks two or more pre-qualified contractors to submit sealed proposals to undertake work based on a pre-prepared proposal package. The client's QS analyzes the contractor's proposals, negotiates with two or more contractors to arrive at acceptable terms and a price for the work, and awards the job to the contractor offering best value for money. Competitively negotiated contracts are often used when awarding contracts for cost plus and term contracts. With negotiation, it is important to establish the objectives of the negotiation at the start. For example, is it to reduce costs or to establish a long-term partnership? In addition, the structure of the negotiation and the information required should be established along with the time constraints. Now moving on to two-stage tendering. This format is also proving to be a popular procurement route just now. It comes in several variants and stage two of the process may involve negotiation. I first came across it 50 odd years ago when clients were looking for a procurement route that would deliver buildings more quickly and efficiently than traditional single-stage competitive tendering based on a bill of quantities. Two-stage tendering combines the best of two worlds, as pricing can be based on a bill of quantities, while at the same time reducing project completion time. It can allow work to start on site prior to the design being finalised, although this should be approached with caution, as there have been several high-profile cases where mission creep occurred 
and contractors carried out works outside of any agreement, and there were disputes over payment. In the case of pre-main contract works, contractors usually require a letter of intent, although these are not without their problems. Now, I'm sorry if you're thinking by now that two-stage tendering is a minefield. It's not really. I'm just pointing out some of the potential pitfalls and how to avoid them. The process is first to pre-qualify main contractors, who are invited to submit a first-stage tender. The first stage selection can be done using a variety of approaches, such as method statements. However, bearing in mind that the first stage is used as the basis for the second stage, it should be as detailed as possible. I have used an approximate bill of quantities that reflect the scope of the work for the proposed project for the first stage tender. Another approach is to use selected work packages along with the preliminaries section. On the basis of this first stage, a contractor is selected to proceed to the second stage. It may be possible to work with two contractors to maintain competition in the second stage negotiation, although I have no experience of this approach. It occurs to me that most contractors wouldn't be interested in taking this route, as there is only a 50-50 chance of winning and potentially a lot of wasted resources. Also remember, that selection at stage one doesn't guarantee the award of the second stage. Now, there is a body of opinion that says that once the second stage commences, the contractor has the client over a barrel, as to pull out of the stage would mean the client had to go back to stage one with the consequential loss of time and extra expense. But this goes back to my earlier comment that trust on all sides is essential for a good outcome. Pre-construction services may be carried out by the contractor between the first and second stages and can include helping the consultant team develop the design or the contractor undertaking all the design development themselves, helping the consultant team develop the method of construction or the contractor developing the method of construction for themselves, all of which has the effect of ensuring buildability. And now, moving on to the second topic, payment and retention. I have often commented on the appalling payment practices in the construction industry. Recently, the government announced it was pressing ahead with legislation forcing large companies to include payment information in their annual reports. This is an attempt to increase transparency around the payment practice of large businesses and bring them into the focus for boards and investors. In addition, the proposed legislation would require qualifying companies, as well as limited liability partnerships, to publish certain information on their practices, policies and performance with respect to retention clauses in qualifying construction contracts with suppliers. This will mean firms will have to say what proportion of money paid to suppliers is being held back as retention and how much is being held from them in retention by clients. Of course, whether this proposed legislation will have any impact remains to be seen. Retention has been a common feature in the construction industry for over a hundred years. Yet over the past few years, there has been a growing shift in the construction industry's views on retentions and whether reform is required. The collapse of Carillion in early 2018 and now ISG, which has left millions in unpaid retentions, and the ever-increasing number of construction company insolvencies that followed, it became apparent that the current legislation system is weighed heavily in favour of those holding retentions, while offering little or no protection or regulation for those providing retentions. Retention is a percentage of payment, generally 3%, held back typically by a client or main contractor to act as security or an assurance that the project works will be completed and that patent defects are remedied. Typically, the first half of the retention is paid when the project is practically complete, whereas the second half is paid following the expiration of the rectification period or the making good of defects. It is estimated that the total amount of retention held in the construction sector in England alone 
over the course of the year is a staggering between three and five billion pounds. Current insolvency rules do not ring fence retention monies when a company becomes insolvent. Currently, retention is merely added to the creditor's pot and distributed to creditors, or not as the case may be, in accordance with the applicable insolvency rules. So, clients and main contractors are essentially given a carte blanche as to how they hold and use retention money. Consequently, it is not uncommon for clients and contractors to use retention money to support cash flow or to protect margins. A recent survey found that 71% of contractors surveyed had experienced delays in receiving retention monies and 44% of contractors surveyed had experience of not being paid at all due to upstream insolvency. In addition, it is not uncommon for contractors or subcontractors to write the retention off as a goodwill gesture to encourage future work. There is also a body of opinion which says that withholding 1.5% of the value of a project is just not sufficient incentive to make a contractor or subcontractor rectify defects. The above mentioned issues have resulted in an industry-led campaign to address the underlying problems caused by retention and to propose alternative mechanisms. These mechanisms include project bank accounts, performance bonds, retention bonds, escrow stakeholders accounts. Escrow is a contractual agreement in which a stakeholder or agent holds funds, retention in this case, on or behalf of two or more parties, releasing them when all the parties have fulfilled their obligations, retentions held in trust funds, and parent company guarantees. Most of the above would be suitable alternative mechanisms to retention in certain circumstances. However, it is thought that those most suited to an industry-wide alternative to retentions are retention deposit schemes and retention bonds, which are already used in other countries. So, what are we waiting for? And finally, a look at soft landings and government soft landings. The term soft landings refers to a strategy to ensure that the transition from construction to occupation is as seamless as possible and that the operational performance is optimised. So the idea is not just to hand the keys to the client and say, get on with it. Instead, soft landings were developed to ease the handover stage for the first three years of occupation. By bridging the gap between construction and operation, it is claimed we can build a more efficient, user-centric and sustainable built environment for the future. The process should include an agreement to provide the information required for commissioning, training, facilities, management and so on, and increasingly will include requirements for building information modelling. Soft landings don't come into play until the later stages of a project, but the project team should be aware this transition needs to be considered throughout the development of a project and not just a point of handover. In an ideal world, the client would designate a soft landings champion. Soft landings is an open source framework developed by BSRIA, available to use and adapt free of charge. However, if you're not a member of BSRIA, you'll need to pay around 60 quid. It comes in two forms, the original, the BSRIA, I'll call it the Building Research Association, soft landings, and government soft landings. The Building Research Soft Landings Framework success prompted the government to develop its own interpretation to suit the public sector priorities. When put side by side, there is considerable similarity between government soft landings and the building research soft landings, the main divergence being that government soft landings are more prescriptive in their approach. The Cabinet Office announced that government soft landings would gradually be introduced alongside BIM for the government estate from 2016. However, for some people, soft landings has been an opportunity lost in the headlines of mandating BIM and many stakeholders, including developers, contractors and government officials, don't fully appreciate the potential benefits of adopting this approach. A key question for clients is, how much soft landings will cost? And what are the benefits? 
Not unsurprisingly, views differ. Experience suggests that the first four stages of soft landings, inception to handover, shouldn't involve appreciable additional cost. The additional fees and costs will mostly be in the post-handover aftercare stages to pay for, for example, an independent post-occupancy evaluation. Anecdotally, it has been reported that it is not unknown for contractors to price out soft landings risk anywhere between £30,000 and £100,000. But according to the Building Research Association, the cost, depending on size and complexity of the scheme, should be within the twelve to sixty thousand pound range. That said, a soft landings budget will be less related to floor area or total contract value, and more related to a project's level of complexity and the degree of technical innovation. Another view is that soft landings are cost neutral and cite examples where the aftercare and post occupancy survey has reduced energy costs considerably by fine-tuning the systems to such an extent that any additional costs are cancelled out. Intangible costs may be incurred where the findings result in additional work being undertaken, such as replacing equipment beyond the 12 months defects liability period. Some clients take a slightly more robust view, which roughly translates to we are already paying you to deliver a building that performs according to your design estimates and lives up to its BREAM ratings. Why should we fork out more to ensure that it does? As discussed at the start of this podcast, fewer and fewer Tier 1 contractors are willing to tender for high-value complex projects due to the poor risk-reward balance. If clients want high-performing buildings, they should be prepared to pay more for them. You want us to take on more and more work and more and more risk, says the industry? Then you must pay for it. Well, that's all from this podcast. I hope that you found it interesting. This has been a podcast from Duncan Cartage Online. Thank you for listening. From Barney and me, we would really appreciate it if you were to subscribe or, if you have time, write a review. Until next time, take care.